Hello, this is the first of the series of lectures which is going to be based on some of the work that I'm doing and it will hopefully review the material that I am trying to use to uh, understand these fish populations in a way so that people that are non-specialists can also understand it. So let me just briefly introduce you to the topic in general. I work primarily with a field of ecology that deals with what's called mark recapture. Mark recapture attempts to understand animals by doing exactly what it says it does, marking animals and then recapturing them in a later date. Uh, down in the picture below you can see a kind of mark here of these animals. This is an amicete getting a mark in the side of the body and that would be useful. Uh, in the future I would know that I've already captured that animal and that would provide information into the models. But the important thing about mark recapture, mod, uh, mark recapture in general is that they revolve around a series of models which provide uh, a probabilities of different um, answers to questions. So let's just back up briefly here and look at uh, some of the basic ideas around why we would even care about something like mark recapture models. So one of the things that we're very interested in in ecology, but in, in general, uh, is understanding if we're dealing with individuals, uh, and sometimes we become interested in uh, populations of individuals, uh, and then in other cases we're interested in the broader sense where individuals inside of communities or these communities uh, in relation to their physical environment. And one thing that we can do to try to understand that is to actually know how animals behave in that environment and how they live within that environment. Uh, what we'd really like to know is where an individual is uh, all the time and where it's come from. But Unfortunately for us, fish do not come with name tags, which is a pity because one of the ways to follow an individual through time uh, would be to know that we're recapturing the same animal over and over again. Recapturing of animals uh, that you know uh, their history from gives you a lot of information. It's the same reason that you take children to doctors and you get regular appointments, especially when they're younger. The amount of information you can collect from someone uh, or something when it's uh, got an entire history associated, it's very, very high, and that's one of the reasons uh, that we, we bring children into doctors so frequently when they're relatively young, uh, and then uh, we don't need to visit the doctor as frequently as we get older. So one of the ways we can actually go about naming fish uh, is the placement of tags, and tags can be a variety of different things. They could be a name tag uh, in the sense that you could put a little sticky tag on the side of the fish. Of course, that would just fall off. But we can also put um, things like uh, plastic uh, bands into fish. We can put uh, glass uh, uh, microchips into fish. Uh, we can put uh, tattoos on fish. Uh, you can also do things like clip fins. Uh, that, won't, that probably won't give you information about the individual you have, but that will give you inf information that you've captured the animal before. In this case, what you have here is what's called a floy tag, and floy tags are very, very common within fisheries science, uh, and they are a, this little tiny bit of plastic. That green area is actually frequently has a printed number on it, and then what's actually embedded here in the fish is a tiny little anchor uh, that prevents the tag from just falling out. So if you were to look at the tags up close, these, are, these would be floy tags that would be associated with uh, a, a standard procedure. What's happened here is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has purchased a series of Floyd tags and then they have them uh, print on these tags different numbers and each each individual of course can receive a number and here you have an enormous number of potential tags. Just with four digits of course you could have 9,999 fish marked and with the increasing uh, number of digits here you can see that you can literally mark uh, millions of fish individually. But one of the things we might want to actually know about is how specific do we need? Do we actually need to get down to the individual? I've alluded here already that you could just mark fish with what we would call a batch tag, like a fin clip. That would give you information that the fish uh, was recaptured. It wouldn't tell you which individual that it was when you captured it the first time, but it would certainly tell you that you've handled it before. So I will call this uh, levels of intimacy. We have uh, a series of levels that we can understand an animal at. You could, in a mark recapture study, at the most 
at the at the simplest level, simply know if an animal uh, is captured before or not. You don't even know necessarily how many times it's been captured before if you've if you've done multiple recaptures, but you know that it was recaptured at least once in the past. And you can go all the way up to something like that Floyd tag where an animal gets a very specific coded number, and that animal uh, you know to the individual history when it was recaptured and, and if you've collected any other data with it, which we would call metadata, then you would know things like how fast it's growing probably uh, and where it's been in the past. So there's levels of intimacy. Let's think of it this way. If, if you were to select from all these penguins uh, and you were to say, well, okay, oh, penguins named John, uh, assuming that penguins had names, you would find that there's probably a wide range of penguins with the name of John. And this is the same function uh, in the sense that if you went out and marked a bunch of fish, uh, you might know if a fish is marked or not. If you increase that and you said, okay, only pigeons that have the specific name John Smith, or in this case, you might say only the types of fish that have multiple types of, of similar marks, uh, then you can increase the level of knowledge about that individual. You can start to get it down to only certain individuals, and that may be very helpful in understanding things like growth, if only certain individuals of a certain size are marked in a certain way. And of course, you can continue to increase this, right? So you can increase the levels of intimacy of knowledge about an individual by increasing the specific name. Here we're going from uh, a relatively broad name to a, a, a much more specific name until you get down to the point where you have so much information about someone that that's the only individual that can be. For us in fisheries, of course, one of the big limitations for knowing this kind of information is that the fish have no interest in keeping track of their uh, names, unfortunately, and they do not carry their social security cards around with them when they are out and about. So we do actually require to produce more knowledge or more intimate levels of knowledge about an animal, more money, and more work effort uh, on an individual. So relatively easy to produce uh, very low levels of intimate knowledge about an individual, much, much harder to get down to an individual level and requires far more effort in that sense. So before you would begin with any research project, one of the first things that you might want to ask is, how much knowledge do I actually need to get to the answers that I need? So what do we actually, what do I need? What do we, what do I need to do a good mark recapture study? Well, that really is dependent on what you want to answer. And different models uh, within a mark recapture framework require different levels of intimacy to provide information about things that they're estimating. So before you begin any mark recapture thing, you actually have to think very carefully about what kind of model you want. Um, and of course, one of the limitations of any model is that it can't do everything. There is no all-purpose model that does everything. Any model that attempts to stretch boundaries uh, often fails uh, everywhere. Usually what we do is we pick a specific model that's very, very good in one area and much weaker in other areas and focus only on the areas where we think it's very strong and try to avoid any areas uh, where it's relatively weak. For instance, the if you have a car, uh, when the car is driving, what it's actually doing is is it is modeling the distance you're driving in the odometer, right? There's not actually someone traveling along and recording your distance. It's using a simple uh, turning wheel to provide some information about the distance you've traveled, but it's using that in a mechanical sense to create a, a model. And that model is not perfect, uh, but it provides very, very good estimates of the distance that your car has traveled probably down to the mile over the course of its lifespan. However, if I said to you, uh, we'd like to use that model to measure uh, distances on the, on the order of uh, feet, uh, you would say that's useless. That's a, that's a useless model. It doesn't provide that kind of information. It won't be that accurate. So in the same way, we will, we will be careful about what models we select. And of course, if you select the wrong model and you spend a long time sort of wandering down a road uh, of uh, overmarking or undermarking your animals, what you can actually end up with is either data you can't use to provide answers to the questions you need, uh, or you can end up in a situation where you simply uh, are stuck trying to use a, a relatively unfit model to try to answer those questions. So just over here on the right, the, this is a fin clip. These are some of the most common, probably the most common technique for uh, uh, marking fish is the clipping of fins. And in salmonids, salmonids include everything, obviously salmon, but they include things like uh, trout uh, and also uh, char, 
uh, and a number of other important fish, including things like whiting. Uh, but those animals frequently have their adipose fin clipped, and that's the fin here that's circled on the red bar, or the red circle on the right, and that's pointed to. Wild populations, of course, will have their adipose fins. Uh, it would be almost impossible for them to lose them. It, I guess it's possible for a predator to, to uh, bite them and remove most or all of the adipose fin, but it would be extremely unlikely. Uh, whereas what has become standard within hatching of salmonids is usually the removal of the adipose fin. And that allows a very, very quick uh, information about whether the salmon is wild or whether the salmon is hatchery-based. And that is common across states and countries. Uh, if you go anywhere, almost anywhere, and you catch salmonids and they want to know if they're hatchery or not, you can quickly look at the adipose fin. And if you find animals without an adipose fin, it's very likely they came from a hatchery. It turns out uh, we can talk about why this, some of the limitations of marking fish. Uh, adipose fins never grow back, but they do seem to be useful at least somewhat for the fish. So removing the adipose fin does have a slight effect on the fish's behavior. And then of course the number one thing you always want to do uh, whenever you're deciding uh, what model to do is formulate what question you want to answer before you begin. It's no, no good to anyone to formulate the uh, question you want to to answer after you've collected your data. That does nothing. Uh, that's a waste of time. And it's a lot of effort to go out and collect data you may or may not need. So the number one thing we do is uh, before we start a study is really decide on what's the question we want to answer. Uh, and again, trying to pick the best model and decide on the best course of approach to actually answer those questions. If you're dealing with something like hatchery salmon, the question you're probably asking is, what percentage of my fish are coming from the hatchery, and what percentage of the fish in my fishery are coming from uh, natural reproduction? One of the most common questions that people deal with, of course, is how many are there? And something that looks very simple, right, is as counting fish is actually very, very difficult. Uh, fish are frequently very hard to catch and they are frequently mobile and counting an individual uh, can be difficult to do so what we actually do is we count only a small percentage of the individuals and then try to understand what proportion of the population they make up so the difficulty of dealing with how many fish out there it's sort of the, one of the most basic questions if you have a fishery right and you want to set a limit one of the things you would certainly like to know is how many fish are even out there to begin with do we have tens of thousands of fish and can we allow a lot of fishing effort or are we dealing with just a few hundred individuals uh, and there could be real problems if we have removed even a few of those animals and if you deal with fish like uh uh, anchovies where we deal with literal billions of in individuals uh, of course you simply can't count that many animals it's impossible you would spend all of your life counting animals and you would have done it for one year uh, the amount of animals that are out there can be vast 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 numbers of animals so the the question of how many fish are there is really where these mark recapture models began to be developed. People really began to ask the question of, can we estimate how many animals are out there without literally catching every animal? Can we go about doing it in another way? And a lot of models are built simply to try to understand this question. Some models, again, the model is, is trying to answer a question, how many are there, but they each have weaknesses. Some are, are more relaxed in some areas and more stringent in others, and others are more uh, stringent in that area and relaxed in the, in the former. So the simplest model for abundance is what we is this Lincoln-Peterson model. And actually, the Lincoln-Peterson model is named after Lincoln and Peterson, who uh, received credit for, for codifying the model, for publishing the model as, as a standard. Uh, but the model was actually, or the, the way to actually go about calculating it, uh, was done in the, it, at least in the early 1800s and probably before that because it's a simple ratio estimator. And... The way that this, this works is that you take a group of animals, the group of animals you want to know the population of, and you mark some of them. Uh, well, you can mark all of them if you're really efficient, but in that case, you you're doing what's called a census, and you don't need to do an estimator. Uh, but in traditional places, you, do, you just mark some of them, and then the only thing you need to know is 
was the fish marked or was it not? Or in, or in other cases, was the animal marked or was it not? And then you go out and collect those fish at a later date and answer that question specifically. You collect the number of animals and you determine if the fish was marked in the first place or not. And this provides you with a calculation of the total number of animals within your populations uh, that you're dealing with. So this is the Lincoln Peterson estimator. So let's go through this. It's like I said, it's just uh, to a fraction equivalent to another fraction. In this case, R stands for the number of recaptured animals. So these would be the animals that you would recapture after you went out and marked them. C would be the total number of captures that you made uh, on the uh, recapture date, and then M is the number of marked animals that you released on the first event. And then we're actually going to calculate population size. So we actually don't know N. We're going to have R, C, and M, and we're going to use that to calculate N. And when you rearrange this so that N is by itself, all you have to do is uh, multiply N to the left-hand side of the equation and move R and C to the right-hand side of the equation. That's just a multi simple multiplication and division. And you get this. You get N hat equals MC over R. And you can do that simply by uh, doing the algebra just to push those letters around. Uh, this N hat, this or caret as we put over this N, means something a little different now. In the top equation, the ratios are true ratios. They produce an exact number. The, the little caret, the hat, means that uh, we don't actually know if M, C, and R are the true values within the population. They are uh, sampled values within a population. And so N is an estimate. It's not an exact value. We don't know that it is the actual population. It's an estimate of what we think is the actual population. And so if you go online, you type in Lincoln Peterson estimator, you'll also find that there's a number of other equations that allow you to calculate something like the error around a population. For right now, though, let's just look at the Lincoln Peterson estimator and try to understand a little bit more about it. So this is a little n hat our arrow is pointing to. So remember, when we go out and sample, what we're actually doing is we're sampling around a mean. The mean in this case uh, is this, this little omega down at the bottom, and that is the, what we call the true mean. It's the actual value associated uh, in, the, in, in the population. So for instance, if we went out today and we said how many fish are in this lake right now, right this instant, there is a true value to that. There must be a true number of fish in there at that lake. There might be a thousand and one, it might be a thousand and two, it might be a thirty million, it might be eight. But there's a true value. But we're not gonna actually know that. What we're gonna do is we're gonna sample and we're gonna find a range of values. Uh, that give us some information about what the true value is, right? So if we went out and sampled the lake and tried to estimate it, we may calculate that on one time we think there's a thousand and five fish, we may think there's a thousand and one fish, we may think there's 990 fish, and then we take the value, the average value, to calculate what we think the average uh, or what we think is the true mean within that. And the more values you take, look at this black line here, uh, you should get a normal, what's called a normal distribution around that true value. So when we take enough of those, we can actually get very close to the true value. Now, on the left, what you're looking at uh, is this uh, blue line is what we call a biased sample. Bias is actually a real thing. Uh, it means that you're off from the mean by s some amount. You're sampling away from the mean uh, consistently. And that's not particularly uncommon. It's relatively common to have biased estimators. What we usually want to see is the bias, what we'd like to see is a bias of zero or bias of a very low amount so that the true value uh, that we're trying to estimate is very close to the average value within the bias. It's not always the case, so we have to be careful about whether we get biased or not. Uh, but we do, we are concerned with bias in science. Right, so that's what I've just discussed here. And so bias actually does exist in science, um, but it's not in the political sense of the word where you use bias to insult another person, prevent their argument from pro uh, providing actually any information within your context. Okay. So in a perfect world, the LP or the Lincoln-Peterson estimator is, a tr is an estimate of the true, uh, the true value of the population. But if we violate the assumptions that we haven't talked about, but we will, 
uh, then we can enter into a situation where we become bi a biased estimator of the population and then we become something like the blue line. And now let's talk a little bit about the assumptions uh, of the model in general. So the Lincoln-Peterson estimator is actually a model. It is a relatively simple model, but it doesn't prevent it from being a model. Uh, one of, of course, here I've listed five of the assumptions of the model, and these are basically you'll see the same kind of assumptions throughout uh, whenever you look up the Lincoln-Peterson estimator. These are written a little bit differently depending on how the uh, author decides to focus on different uh, assumptions. I've tried here to make them into a, a relatively standard list that makes logical sense that will combine uh, some bullet points that other authors may separate, uh, but I think uh, in general provides a, a very good and simple list for, for people looking for a broad understanding of what the Lincoln-Peterson estimator does. So of course one of the things that, that we would expect within any uh, sampling is that sampling is random. So you're not going to only sample a large fish for instance unless the only thing you want to know is what's the population of large fish. If your population question is broader, you, let's say you want to know what the population in the lake is, you would not just sample large fish. They may be different in some ways than small fish. Another assumption that we're going to make in this model is that marked animals distribute themselves randomly within the population after they're released. And that should be in, make intuitive sense. If you release all your marked animals in one area of a lake and they never distribute themselves throughout uh, the lake, if you go out and resample at the other end of the lake and you find no marked animals, it doesn't mean you haven't marked animals in that lake. It means that they're not on that side of the lake. They're not well distributed. And so one thing that you need to be careful of when you're doing uh, Lincoln-Peterson uh, modeling is that you actually release the animals hopefully right where you caught them but at, at worst case scenario at least around the area where excuse me, you capture them so that they can be uh, they can mix with other with a population that's unmarked. Another estimate for the Lincoln-Peterson or another assumption for the Lincoln-Peterson and this is true of a lot of models uh, is that tags are not lost or overlooked. And by, by lost, I think that's relatively straightforward, right? If a tag falls out, uh, if a tag becomes obscured by something, if a tag is very hard to read uh, and you can't see it, that would be considered a lost. An overlooked tag is a tag that's actually present, but you can't see it, uh, or, you don't, or you really don't see it, let's say. Uh, and that can happen when people are working too quickly. It can happen when it's dark and you don't see a color very well. It can happen if someone's colorblind and you've marked things uh, with green and red tags and they can't tell the difference between the two. Uh, it can happen in a number of situations. But one of the assumptions that we try to make is that their tags are not lost or overlooked. Now, of course, all of these assumptions can be dealt with um, in different ways if you think you violated them and attempt to find a modeling situation that that compensates for that. We try not to get into those situations, but they can happen. And tag loss and um, uh, non-detection is a relatively common problem that many studies face, and there are a number of ways to try to deal with that. We're not going to deal with that right now, uh, but of course that's something that people consider, and it's especially important in something like a large marine fishery where if you release a lot of animals into the ocean, uh, you're very unlikely to have uh, those animals recaptured. And when you do, you're dealing with relatively few animals. And so you need to be very certain that no tags were lost or overlooked because you have relatively small values and they drive the population estimates very, very quickly. Another, another assumption that these models make is that marked animals behave identically to unmarked. And what that means is that a marked animal, for instance, does not hide more because it's marked. A marked animal does not um, become afraid of being sampled. A marked animal does not learn how to avoid you. A marked animal uh, is not likely to be uh, preyed upon more heavily because it's marked. And that is why we use relatively simple marks whenever possible, one to save money, but also to try to prevent uh, impacts on the, the animal that we're dealing with. And then the last thing for the Lincoln-Peterson estimator, and this is what really sets it apart from another group of models, which are called open population models, is that the population is closed to additions or losses. And what closed means is that they don't happen, that they're not a real thing, uh, that additions and losses, and additions come from uh, either uh, immigration or uh, what we would call recruitment, so new animals within the population getting large enough to be captured. 
Those are the two places we can get additions. And then losses come from two very simple locations. They're either lost to emigration, so animals either physically leave the, the area, or animals die, mortality. And death can come in many forms. Death can be a result of parasites. Death can be a result of uh, getting trapped in an area that has poor conditions. Death can be the result of getting eaten. So the Lincoln-Peterson estimator assumes that the population is closed between your sampling events, that there is no loss or gain of animals between the times that you sample to estimate it. And right, so I just mentioned this, so anything that brings an animal in or out of a population is considered an open population. And that in those places, if you have what we would call openness, then and we would not really think the Lincoln-Peterson estimator is appropriate. So, of course, one of the things that I find that students find really upsetting about that is that, well, that's ridiculous. Mortality occurs every second, every day. Uh, and that must mean that the Lincoln-Peterson estimator is a poor model for the number of animals. And it, wouldn't it just inherently be violated as soon as you as soon as you put the fish back in the water? Isn't it violated? Isn't it useless to use? Well, the Lincoln-Peterson estimator is violated as soon as you put the fish back in the water, as soon as the fish um, and exits back in the water. And therefore, it, there is bias to your estimate. But keep in mind, if the bias is very, very low, you may actually not even be able to detect the bias. And so the Lincoln-Peterson estimator, when used appropriately, can be very, very good at estimating the number of animals within your population. Now, if you leave long periods of time between your sampling events so that mortality can occur or that losses can occur relatively easily, then a closed population model like the Lincoln-Peterson model would be entirely inappropriate. So... I've written here on the slide what you can actually do to try to test this out yourself. It's a relatively straightforward experiment. Um, and what you just need is a jar filled with dry beans and dry beans that are all the same. Now, you'll know here if you if you look down and look at the directions, I've told you to, to uh, mark the beans with a marker. That attempts to get at the problem of marked animals behave differently from unmarked animals and you may ask how can a bean behave differently well actually if you're pour let's say you're pouring beans out and you've said okay well marked beans will be white beans and unmarked beans will be black beans well if white beans are a little bit lighter if they don't have as much weight as a black bean and you pour them out they may not come out in the same way as a black bean or let's say if you um take beans and you put some, uh, you put a nick in them or, or you break off a piece of them. They may behave very, very differently than they did originally when they were, they were in the jar. So marking the beans with a marker is a way to try to get around that. Now, of course, the marker does add a small amount of weight to the bean, so it will change the behavior of the bean. But again, the bias may be so low that you can't detect it. So if you're interested in trying this out, go ahead and do this on your own uh, and, tr and use the beans within the uh, jar. And of course, you're welcome to also think of ways in which you can try to violate the assumptions and see how good or how bad your estimates of the population within your jar are. So here's, an, here's a little bit. Uh, more on that experiment. You can also do this where you expand it. You can have someone remove some beans, um, like let's say less than 5%, and that will be act as a mortality event within your uh, between your sampling events. Okay, so let's talk about some of the problems. So I've, I've, I have talked to you now about some, what some of the assumptions of the model are. I've also introduced you into a little bit about how you actually might go about doing it. But well, let's talk about some of the problems of the Lincoln-Peterson estimator, <clears throat> because obviously if it was some sort of magical tool, we could just go out and just do Lincoln-Peterson estimators. But Lincoln-Peterson estimators are usually uh, a little bit vulnerable to um, that mortality thing. And one of the other problems for us is that Lincoln-Peterson estimators only work if you sample just once. There is no way to use a Lincoln-Peterson estimator if you're going to go out and sample multiple times. Another issue for the Lincoln-Peterson estimator is that if the number of recaptures you get is low, let's say less than five animals, that can cause real problems for the model. Then the model becomes what we say it's very unstable, uh, and the, the estimated population that it produces will be v wildly different um, depending on how many animals you have collected. 
Another problem, and this is a problem I deal with all the time, is what if you can't assume closure? Uh, what if you're dealing with open populations? Well, if you can't assume closure, then the Lincoln-Peterson estimator is not useful for you, uh, and you have to move on to another model. Of course, thankfully, of course, there are more models that we can try, um, but let's just move through the Lincoln-Peterson a little bit more. So what happens if the LP model, LP estimator doesn't work, or if the LP estimator has values that approach zero? Well, if you have any values that approach zero, then you have a model that is extremely sensitive to what small changes or what maybe what we call per perturbations within the model, so the number of animals you catch. And statistically, um, it, it becomes a situation where the error bar uh, actually can shrink um, because there, is, uh, l there are fewer values to deal with. But the uh, overall problem with the model is that it's, it's less and less stable. So the statistical value around the mean can show more confidence than we actually have in the model. So one of the things that we can do, and what has been done, is a slight modification of the Lincoln-Peterson model. And in this case, what, what people have done is they've added one within a, within a fraction. And what that does is one divided by one is still one. Um, and if you add one to a fraction and then you subtract one away from the fraction, that should do nothing to it, right? If I say two plus one minus one uh, is the same as two, that is correct. Uh, and that that is what we use here. Again, assuming that all the letters mean the same thing that they did before and the assumptions are the same. And this provides some protection when uh, values start to approach zero. And so you can imagine if you have things like R very close to zero or at zero, uh, then this model will provide a way to prevent uh, denominators or uh, numerators from going to zero in the fraction, which can be really annoying. Another thing that we've really wanted to address overall is what we call resampling. And resampling is when we go out and do sampling on multiple events. One of the important parts about resampling is going out multiple times allows us to mark lots and lots of fish. And when we're dealing with populations in the order of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of animals, it's extremely unlikely in an eight-hour shift that you will mark enough animals to make a significant dent in the population. So you have to go out multiple times to do it. And as a result, uh, we need models to deal with that. So Zoe Schneebel uh, worked in uh, Wisconsin in the 1930s, and she developed a way using, you will recognize this very quickly, using the Lincoln-Peterson estimator uh, to develop a system under which you could resample a population over and over again, and that provides a way of uh, going out and marking very, very large populations instead of doing enormous amounts of effort on a single day uh, within the Lincoln-Peterson estimator. So here it is. It uses these giant E's, uh, which are, which in, in a mathematical term stand for the sum of. Um, and they, it doesn't actually mean very much in the sense that it's not very hard to understand. Uh, it means it's important within the model, uh, but it's fairly easy to do. So when we have multiple periods where we're marking and recapping, animals, uh, what we actually do is something like this, where we record the sample day, uh, and then on each day we record the number of captured and recaptured animals, and then we know the number of marked animals, right? Because if number of captured animals uh, should be everything that we've collected on that day, the number of recaptures should be all the animals that had tags, and marked animals should be the difference between the two. There should be, uh, there's only two states you can be in. You can either be recaptured or you can be marked. And then what you actually do is you use that big E, right? So you do what's called the sum of recaptures. And every single day you get an estimate. Um, and you also do the sum of captures and marks here and, and multiply them together. They get these rather ugly numbers and then divide them. And what you get is a population estimate every day. And what should happen is your population estimates should converge to some point. So what you can see is on our first day we estimated there, there are about 1,780 fish in the lake. Uh, and by the last day, our model seems to be satisfied that that's about the value uh, that we're approaching. And just by coincidence, we hit very close to that on the first day, a little bit high on the second day, uh, a little bit low on the third day, and then we, we got very close on day four and five. So if someone came to you and asked how many fish were within this lake, you would say there's about 1,800 fish within this lake. So where have we actually gotten to in this lecture? Well, we've actually so far discussed just closed population models. We haven't talked about open population models, which is actually what I work on for my dissertation because I deal with time frames that are on the order of months to years. And when you're dealing on the orders of months to years, of course, 
animals are definitely dying on the order of months to years, um, and they're definitely moving on the order of months to years. Closed population models are probably working on the order of hours to days, and so in my situation, I can't, I can't deal with them. Uh, and then, of course, if we know that we can't fill a closed population model, we have to move on to an open population model. And when we move on to open population models, what you'll see is our level of intimacy needs to increase again. And this is where things like the Floyd tag will become useful. The picture at the top is actually a Floyd tag injector. It's just a needle down which the Floyd tag's anchor will pass, and then it will stick in the fish here. This is actually an Atlantic salmon that's marked with a Floyd tag. Uh, and then, of course, open population models do require this higher level of knowledge, this higher level of intimacy. And open population re models require something very high. They require us to know down to the individual. Uh, and therefore, most of the time, we try to avoid open population models because knowing down to the individual is usually fairly difficult. And it takes a lot of time, actually, to work with an animal. If every time you capture an animal, you have to figure out which individual it is, uh, that can take a lot of time in the field. Even if you're dealing with it take, taking four to five seconds to determine if an animal is an individual or not, uh, if you do four to five times tens of thousands of animals, as opposed to one or two seconds times tens of thousands, you've actually doubled or tripled your workload. And when multiplying by such large numbers of animals, that can have serious impacts on the amount of people and effort you need to put out. So down here, this is what's called a pit tag. This is actually a tiny uh, computer chip that's inserted inside of a glass container. And then that so it doesn't react with the fish. And then that's placed inside of the fish, usually in the body cavity. Uh, these are common also in pets. They're very, very useful. They don't use a battery. They actually use a, the charge uh, from a handheld unit that passes over them. And so they last indefinitely. There's no lifespan on them until, uh, until they're lost uh, or that the animals died and buried. You won't, you'll won't. you always have the pit tag around. So pit tags are very, very useful for these kind of things. Here I'm pointing to it with the little arrow. Uh, and then you can also get into very complex individual tags. This is uh, an acoustic tag or and also provides uh, probably some information about the depth and the temperature and uh, where the fish is actually located. And so big tags like this, you also see a Floyd tag at the back of the animal. Uh, big tags like this are also common for individual marking. Okay, so that's the end of this lecture. Uh, that's at least a brief introduction to closed population models. And next time we'll talk about open population models, which is what I primarily deal with.